are also very good at moving or uh, getting a sense of where the puck is moving, right? Uh, instead of where it has been. So, so they have a good sense of understanding of where the world is moving, which is what we'll try and kind of explore with them today. Um, and uh, stick to the core theme, which is new world, new rules and new mindsets. Uh, I want to pick up something which, is, which I found interesting. Sumit's son currently is studying uh, in Yale and um, I think uh, doing some very cutting edge work on quantum computing, right? And um, that's the kind of technology that's likely to kind of impact our world going forward. And Sumit has a very interesting ringside view because he's been a technology man himself. So Sumit, tell us a little about what you're kind of observing as when he's kind of as at 18 doing things that are that are truly remarkable. He's looking at. Let's look at the quantum computing philosophy, and uh, that sort of drives into how. Uh, the world is, was never black and white and we had these rules because we wanted to make it black and white. Uh, I think you also talked about the fact that you have to balance, it is never black and white, you have got to, to balance it and the new way of approaching the world is uh, to look at all shades of grey, to look at how do you balance the, uh, the probabilities of the world and, and come up with judgments. We did not have too many options uh, from our careers, uh, from the books we read, from the movies we saw. We, we were, uh, our options were very few. Uh, today's generation has a lot more options. So how do you do decision making when you have a lot more options? It is never binary. We used to bring back everything down to binary. We used to have decision trees which brought it down to a manageable set. These days you can't do it, it is way too many options. So when, when he's looking through quantum computing today, it is about that whole concept of decision making. Quantum computers think differently. They are not breaking down everything into zeros and ones. It's a whole lot of probabilities in the middle. And that is how they define everything going forward. From the cars they buy to the books they read to the, to the friends they make. Uh, we had few. Uh, they are able to maintain this, uh, distribute their thinking, uh, seek participation, in their own life. Harish, um, you've kind of over your long career, um, built and shaped many different companies. I don't know what last count, about 18 or thereabouts? 60, right? Yeah. 16, okay. Um, but you've also got a very interesting vantage point observatory as an angel investor and as a private equity investor as well in seeing the next generation shape and build out new companies, especially in this digital age. Give us a sense of what you're observing. We've seen two revolutions now. We've seen the industrial revolution that actually just multiplied the bandwidth to human beings to do things. I think we've seen the digital revolution, the rules have already changed. I think everybody is now has a software skin, every firm, every employee, every company. So what's really happening is that digital is essentially going to learn the new rule that we got extra physical bandwidth or you have got extra mental and social and collaborative bandwidth. I think the whole explosion that's happened is that earlier companies tried for, you know, we need to get scale, but here Netflix launches 100 countries in one day, right? Uh, we need to multiply the bandwidth of a company. So you have a company called Craigslist, have you ever heard of it? It's got the worst looking website in the world, right? So it's not about how good something looks and how nice the buttons are. 50 people run a billion dollar revenue company have been profitable from day one and probably makes over 900 million dollars in profit. So it's not necessary. So the economies of scale, economies of scope that were ideas that the industrial revolution brought about, that production has to be the core of a company, produce more. If you build up distribution, then you need to distribute more to get advantage of the scope. I mean, all of those are coming available. Well. That's available. The, those are gifts of technology. Well. So when you see the young people, I think the fact that if they build something, you can code a billion dollar company into existence in 10 days, right, or 15 days. You can set, you can sit down and code it into existence. So I think that's what the confidence that's coming in. That's why capital is flowing in. And the people who know the gifts of technology, who are able to understand that this, you know, you can reach out to millions of people. You can set up a store in Bangalore and provide material to anywhere in the world now, right? So all that infrastructure is falling into place and you don't have to own any of it. Remember that. Uh, digital technology allows companies to collaborate. So Uber exists because it sits on Google Maps. Uber is, if Google Maps combines with Uber, combines with the payment system, so therefore you have a new layer which allows the taxi to be 
Hmm. So I think this entire new thinking of how you can collaborate, how you can combine things, how you can use available cloud software to build large scale new ways of doing business, the same business, right? We are a bookshop now, right? We've seen how bookshops have got disrupted all over the world. So somehow this bookshop has to pull back to basics because it can no longer be selling books. It needs to be a place for experience. But you have to play to your strength. Every this bookshop cannot become Amazon, and Amazon is not trying to become this bookshop, right? So therefore, every company needs to figure out what it needs to use in this new world. Uh, the gifts of technology are available to everybody, even to us. How much does uh, 15 GB of data storage cost us? Nothing. Your phone has more computing power than the NASA computer in the 90s, which launched Apollo 13, right? So you have the power of a supercomputer virtually in your pocket. Uh, you have the ability to reach anybody. You can WhatsApp anybody, talk to anybody in the world for free virtually. This combining all this is what the young people have at least got a new mindset to. And I think we are stuck in, you know, generation that's stuck in the old way of doing business, the old way of competing. And I think the youngsters are. A fearless because they need to be. I mean, they're realizing that you know the opportunity created is massive. Uh, capital is available. Con the concept of collaboration, I think, has changed dramatically yeah. in the in the in the thing that people are bring, building small components and being able to bring yeah. the whole thing together. And and I think that wasn't there. Even Indian companies today have always thought that they can vertically integrate completely from well to household, as we we know. Uh, many many companies even today want to buy the entire ecosystem. That is what has changed. That people are no longer yeah. buying the entire ecosystem. But I do want to pick up one of the points that I think Sumitra touched upon and you certainly spoke about, which is the fact that we live in a era of abundance, right? Yeah. Um, and that's a difficult thing for our generation to accept because we've grown up in a scarcity economy, right? Um, how does that kind of change the the mindset of people, young people particularly, who are coming into the world with exciting ideas? The world has moved to network businesses and and. As there comes a tipping point in that network when it uh, sort of takes off, but there also comes a tipping point when the network plateaus, and you need to be aware of when, uh, like a Facebook has plateaued today, and Facebook understood this long time back, and they bought the WhatsApps and they bought the Instagrams of the world because they saw their customers moving and the and the platforms plateauing. So and they innovated, they they transformed themselves to saying that I'm going to take on the next uh, next uh, billion people on my platform. So I think network businesses have a different mathematics than fully vert vertically integrated businesses. How many of you are evaluated by a bell curve? <laughs> we have been evaluated by a bell curve. Like we all all have been evaluated at some point in time in bell curve. Bell curve makes an makes an assumption that everybody is an average and some people are more and some people are less. Network businesses are actually never evaluated on a bell curve. Uh, a bell curve means that there is an average human being, and if you are too high, then you are at the six sigma, two three sigma. Bell curve says that actually there can be an eleven feet person. There could be somebody who is so extraordinary that you're going to treat him as extraordinary person. Bell curve brings everybody down to average, which was of the industrial era. Yeah. In today's business, of network businesses, there could be somebody who is so extraordinary that you will give him five x his salary next year because he. Has been so extraordinary. He has created that network, and this HR paradigm shift uh, has to be there in the in the company. I mean, I'm not saying five x. You can reward him in very, various different ways, uh, but make him feel special. And most people in this network economy do not work for money. That is the other thing. All of Linux has been built by people who got zero money out of it. It is the primary operating system in the world today. There are many such companies which work on network businesses and and. Using the network business to grow, the Ubers of the world, the Netflix of the world, the, the WhatsApp of the world, they are all network businesses. So we have got to look at it. Uh, they they follow a different set of principles, and our our next generation is following that uh, that principle. Right, but both of you are part of um, alumni networks, I'm sure. Uh, both IITs. Um, you went to Carnegie Mellon after that, right? Yeah. And um, you went to IIM Calcutta. Now, when you go back to your reunions, um, batch reunions. How many, do, how many people in the batch, to your mind, um, and I like some percentages, are, to your mind, really have worked hard to stay relevant today? Um, Harish? How many people? Very few. Very few. 15%? 10%? 10-15%. Yeah. Same. Same? Same. Because why is, that, why is that? And just share... I think success, you know, as, as Hindu philosophy always said, success has the seeds of destruction within it. 
So once once you're successful, you believe your way is the right way. And the challenge is that all of us, and including companies, it's not just people. Uh, their success creates a lens which will give you the world. And the lens is very hard to break. So it's, it requires tremendous effort to say that I'm going to keep learning. And there should be an incentive to do that as well. So I, I think there's a personal incentive. As I, as I spoke yesterday, in the, I think all of us have a handphone in our hand. Uh, the best business models in the world are playing on your phone. Every year, in almost 200 or billion dollars are spent to excite people on the phones. There is no need to read any books or anything, say that, but the phone tells you everything. All business models are being tried. It's a, you are the most fertile experiment ground in the world, which is available to for free. Most companies are trying business models there. So it's not even that you just reach out too far. Between Twitter and the apps on your phone, you have a sense of what's changing around you. Share with us, and I'll come to uh, Sumit after that, share some things that you do uh, at your end to stay relevant. I think one thing I mean, and the second when I invest in it, I think one of the big things that one has to tell uh, even startup founders is that what's changed now is that the cost of experimentation has gone down to nearly zero. There is no need to think that you need to be right. Customers will tell you when you're right. So one of the things that we've all got into this idea that you need to be perfectly planned, make a business plan, make a uh, product and then you know, as you make some assumptions about the market. All those paradigms are gone. You can do A-B testing every single day, every single minute. So there is no need to actually sit and you know, overthink and, and then you'll make an error then. In fact, what you need to do is allow customers to actually reveal their preferences to you. So one of the big things I do is make sure that those businesses are doing A-B testing day and night. It's very difficult, you know, we instinctively don't strike people because we have an urge to be right. As managers and as people who run businesses, there is an urge, we want to be right. There is no need to be right. You just have to be playing. The customers will reveal the preference and you find their way. That's why you find businesses pivoting. But the, remember, there's a company called Booking.com runs 10,000 A-B experiments at any moment. And it's been doing that for years. It's one of the most successful travel companies in the world. Uh, in fact, when Priceline was going down the two at the bottom, this small company in the UK, and its fortunes have completely changed a multi billion dollar giant now. All they do is continuously experiment. I'm sure people have booked tickets on it. It's all uh, about hotels on it. It's fantastic business. So you can run a very small business with this whole mindset that there is no need to be right anymore. We've been all taught uh, from school. From work that you know being right is the way to go. And the second thing we've been taught in all education is that if you work harder, you win. Whereas actually in the business world today, you may want to do something differently. If something is too hard, you get doing it wrong. We never taught that. Mm-hmm. If you're getting 80 marks in math, I'll work harder and get 90. But business world is no longer like that. If you're getting 80 in maths in math, um, marks in math, you don't have to do math. Change the way you do something and do better at it. Because the option of switching over is hardly any cost, right? So I think there are some fundamental issues that we have to revisit in terms of how we look at the world today because it, the cost of failure is down to zero. You can build a company in hundred thousand dollars and it fails you know it didn't work, right? You don't have to set up a whole infrastructure. You can hire, go hire a bunch of guys, you can hire a place to rent to start working and learn very quickly. So therefore the confidence of the second time you start a business will be much more. In fact, you find the second time founder, that's why they succeed. That's right. But look at the whole paradigm is try it out, make it work. Don't make assumptions anymore. I mean, those are the things that we have so all stop not to do. So that activity mindset and all of that. So what is the VCs uh, following your advice? Uh, because they are, they are forced to actually, what happens is that somehow uh, they, end up, uh, they are asking the same, it's a wrong question. They are most like that. Can you expand on that? Meaning, uh, Can you expand I mean, on that? They are looking for business plans which, as an entrepreneur, as a startup founder, I I know I'm I'm speaking through the wrong part of my body when I'm speaking to them because I know that I have no control over what the universe is going to present to me tomorrow. Correct. I should be ready for it. They need to see my ability to transform every day. Both of you teach um, at, at business schools as well, right? Uh, um, Harish has been teaching a course on digital transformation at SPJ and um, my alma mater and so it also I think has relationships with Carnegie Mellon as well at IIT as well. So tell us when you look at uh, the way uh, business education is, is kind of, and I think she spoke a bit briefly about it, what, what concerns him. Um, what are the things that you observe about the way that we need to start changing the way that business education is planned and conceptualized and taught? 
that helps me stay relevant because they are all young people who are teaching me in those three weeks what is relevant in this universe. I want to stay relevant in that. The 25 year old, the 26 year old uh, who are looking at the world, what are they watching? What are what drives them? So for me, those three weeks are my education, and not I mean I treat it as that. Got it. Harish, uh, would you want to take on? No, so I, you know, I talk to them about business model innovation and digital transformation. I think the biggest thing I talk to them about is when they go in the companies, what's going to happen is that most companies, when they start, very simply, you start a company, you want a certain outcome. I want to start with blue ribbon gin, or I want to make perfume or talcum powder. And in the beginning, all companies are innovative. It's like all of us knew how to draw a thing five years ago, right? After we stopped, right? So it's the same cycle playing out. So the outcome determines the process in the beginning. And slowly as you scale the company, the process becomes the determinant of outcomes. And it narrows the bandwidth of the phone completely because they can't feel outside the They've always been rewarded for the process, right? So one of the things when you have to, you can't do business model innovation. You can't just, you can't speed up processes. One of the things that companies are making mistake on is by using digital technology to speed up the process. But the process is no longer relevant in certain cases. In most cases. So one of the things to go by, you know, I talk to the company, when you go into the company, you see these processes. So I do case things and tell them, these are the processes which are running. And you don't have to go and question everything. Because, you know, the story of the monkeys where once that monkey tried to climb the ladder, the other people, and the last monkey who entered, they don't know why they don't I mean, climb the ladder at all, right? So it's the same situation that if you want to go in a firm, the first thing is to step back and actually question why are certain processes needed anymore. Because we've all had processes, hierarchies, bureaucracies, uh, because we were an information-starved organization earlier. Today, data is flowing on every port of a company. Uh, uh, young people uh, and, and the decision-making no longer needs to go all the way up and all the way down. Right? So, so it's all about that first question that can you do this uh, job, can you rewrite this company again in the current environment? Assume that there is no human being and how to do the process there. Assume everything was digital. And then think back and figure out how to add people into it. But that's dangerous territory to tread on for the simple reason that our organizations are ready to. So they're not. They're not. So I, I, know, I explained to them the biggest struggle with this. Yeah. But you need to continue to fight it and move it. Somebody at the top will grow you. Because every company is protecting its silos, protecting their jobs. Yes. But when young MBAs go in, several companies are allowing young MBAs to speak now. Several CEOs are saying, young people come and tell me what's going on. And I think in that forum, if you go and pitch it the right way, you will be able to make a difference. Uh, my name is Rohit Shivastav. I represent a company which uh, has customers uh, uh, as a group, third citizen of this country. So we're speaking of uh, a customer base of uh, excess of 250 million within India. How easy or how uh, difficult is it going to be to understand why did an offering fail? Why did the customer reject it? Uh, and get some of those insights and puts in real time to be able to make those changes before you know something goes down. Because as I said, uh, in the network economy, uh, if you succeed quickly, conversely, you're going to fail also very, very quickly. So, can I yeah. Yeah. so I'll tell you one other thing. Yeah. If, you're, if, you're need, if you think you're a retail shop, then you will become irrelevant because somebody is coming online. But if you think I'm going to meet the need of shopping, so if you define yourself, because offering has to change, whatever company produces, there will be competition, there will be evolution of customers, new companies are coming in. So I think the moment you define your business as the offering, you are set to fail. It's like LPs came, CDs came, streaming came, or like video, movies came and now YouTube and now TikTok, right? So all these are versions of audiovisual needs. All these are versions of, let's say, uh, 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 entertainment needs. So shopping, for example, you know, it's not as if home shopping didn't exist, home delivery didn't exist, retail shops didn't exist. Everything existed before Amazon came in. It's the way the bundle is put together. It's the moment you go down to the core need. The needs are always growing. More people want to shop more often. More people want to shop in shops also more often. If you see Apple, half a billion customers pass through its stores. Now, what is it done? It has defined the way shopping has to be done. There is a genius sitting there, then you can hang around with the devices. They are almost making it a, a, a playground for you to play around. So I think, I think that you know, when you get narrowly defined by the offering, you are destined to fail actually. The, the other thing that uh, you, you mentioned booking.com and doing frequent 
uh, testing of your team where you're not always trying to find the reason why something is happening. You're just saying that this is the trend, I need to change it now. It is not going the way I want. I don't need to know the reason today. Over a period of time, I will need to know the reason of this, this trend. But I have been able to react to micro level uh, transactions that are happening and because computing allows us to do it today, allows us to look at micro level transactions. All of these are fractal models. If you if you uh, know fractal mathematics, it says that any fraction is also similar pattern as the larger thing. So if you start following smaller and smaller and smaller durations of time and look at transactions in that, it will follow a pattern. If you aggregate them over a period of time, they will follow a pattern. If you take an even larger period of time and a larger geography, they will follow a pattern. Are you able to understand patterns fast 